now you can say the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I almost I lost it. I have to click a little thing here that says, got it. Uh, <laughs> by staying in this meeting, you present it being recorded. All right, got it. Got it. So you were saying that I, I'm the kind of person that, that appears to like facts. Right, right. In truth, I am probably, I live in more of a fantasy zone than just about anybody else I know. I am always um, inventing um, a scenario in my mind of, well, if I did this or if I went there and I, and I love playing roles. I've been going through uh, artists, the artist way, the book, uh, the artist's way. Oh gosh. I've started and, it like 10 times. How far oh, have you gotten on it? Uh, about chapter three, but it's been well over a month and I've made it to the third with the That's third week. That's pretty good. But the, the thing that I, I really like about that, and here we go off into a, into a side, uh, into a siding the best but the, are the morning pages. The I love, I love the writing, uh, the, the morning pages that, that she encourages you to do. The brain and in doing that, I, um, in doing that, I, I realized that since I was a little kid, I have enjoyed the, the, the times of my life that have been really fun. Uh, have been when I've been playing a role, when I've been being someone other than myself, which, I mean, we could get into that whole thing. That but, might but, be kind but, of sad. But just to direct, I don't want to interrupt, but I want to direct because that's what fascinates me. And that's what I've noticed in your nonfiction. And I've never seen anyone do this except purposefully, but you seem to do it instinctually. How do you marry that with non... How did you come uh, from being who you are, who clearly like me, like a tiny bit eccentric and quirky and interested. How do you marry Thank that you. with a love to not for nonfiction and translating it and well, transposing that for yeah. us? Here, here's the thing. The other thing I know about myself and the reason I think that nonfiction works better for me than fiction um, is that I love being the smartest person in the room. Uh, and <laughs> You know what? And I'm like that. It, I'm the I'm the guy and somewhat annoyingly, but I'm the guy who if if you tell me you're going to a town and I've been there, like I'm a native San Franciscan. I was born uh, and, and grew up in the San, in San Francisco, born in San Francisco, grew up in the Bay Area. If you tell me you're going to San Francisco, I will annoy the crap out of you with emails or iMessages <laughs> suggesting places to eat and things to do. Um, and, and I just, and so I'm, I'm that guy, I'm that guy that, uh, you know, if you, if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you a much longer answer than you wanted. All right. Which is what so I was saying about facts. Maybe it's not facts. Maybe it's information. Yeah. Nonfiction allows me to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm doing a book now. It's a conservative political book and I, I and and it allows me to be the voice of authority to people who are really interested in the topic. I, I did a book a month or so ago about Richard Nixon and some interesting things about Richard Nixon that I didn't know, that he was quite liberal in his social programs. He wanted uh, 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 universal health care for everyone, uh, among other things. So here I am. Um, uh, doing this book, I'm the smartest guy about that topic for those however many hours it took me to read it. And so you ask, why do I, you know, how did I marry a guy who personally lives in fantasy land with the way I deliver nonfiction? I, 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 I think I become the author and um, and then I and I, I let their voice come out, and I get to play the smartest guy in the room for a while. So that I think is why it works for me. Oh, do you know that's the first explanation of nonfiction I've ever heard that makes me even like it a tiny bit. <laughs> that's no, we got one. <laughs> that's exactly what I love about the books that I get to forget. We're we're going to pretend that I didn't make the comment about how I love all murders and psycho killers because I like becoming the characters and enjoying, well, you know, in the moment. And if you could do that with nonfiction. Well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've done, I'm in the middle of, a, of five or six books that written by Alan Dershowitz. Um, I think the lawyer, I think Alan Dershowitz is a brilliant um, 
constitutional scholar. I don't agree with some of his recent, uh, you know, some of his recent opinions on on various things, but I love uh, narrating Dershowitz's books because it it I become Dershowitz. I uh, I don't I mean I don't emulate his voice, although I listen whenever I can find an author's uh, YouTube videos or whatnot. I'll listen. Yeah. I'll just listen to them. Not to pick up the accent. To pick up but their essence. Just, just pick up their essence. Uh, Chuck yeah. Robb, a former governor of, of Virginia, a uh, distinguished Southern gentleman. I listened to a lot of video of his. And what I told the editor or the, the casting director was, I'm going to do this a little bit slower than I typically read. Because the guy just, he was very deliberate in his in the way he spoke. And I knew he wouldn't run sentences together. I could even see him writing the thing, you know, with a pencil almost. So you're having uh, fun. You're having fun oh, when gosh, you're doing yes. these. Oh, gosh, yes. There's only been a couple uh, of books uh, in the past five years that I haven't had fun doing. And there have been a couple that were excruciating. Why did you turn one down? You were going to tell me before the call. I'm glad we didn't miss it because I want to. You don't have to give yeah. names, obviously. Okay, I um, uh, I recently turned a book away. I I I, I auditioned for the book, and um, a small publisher. I auditioned for the book. They they said they actually invited me. You know that the thing that hey Jim, would you are you interested in this? Yes, could you give me three minutes? So I so I prepped up some pages and I and I did, and uh, it was a. Uh, uh, it was a religious book, came from the, the Christian perspective. And, um, and after, I was, after I read it, and it was a controversial topic on, on um, gay, uh, the gay lifestyle, homosexuals. And, um, it was, and it was an interesting premise. So I wanted to see where this, where this author was going. So I, f I went, uh, they had sent me the entire uh, manuscript. So I went through, I went to, you know, chapter 10, you know, where you really get into the payoff, the conclusion. And they'd asked you, you auditioned and they'd said, yes, do the book, right? Uh, they had not yet offered me the book, but they, I was one of a couple people, you know, being considered uh, okay. maybe author, the author wanted to, you know, uh, have, have a, <laughs> whatever it was. Well, I'm reading and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. The things that they were saying and espousing, everyone's entitled to their opinion as long as it's not crazy. Right. Um, and but you're I entitled just, not to give your voice to an opinion if you're fundamentally yeah, against it. Exactly. And I, I mean, I've done I've done books for Christian audio and, and other Christian publishers that have um, questioned gay lifestyle. Um, but this went this went too far. And I, I won't go into how far it was, but it was just I thought, you know what? I I have a lot of gay friends and I I can't um, I can't do this book. And, and yeah. still be their friend. And so I, um, man, I just thought, okay, gosh, what do I do? You know, uh, do I, this was the first time for this publisher that, that they had uh, contacted me. What do I do? So I, I finally just, I sent an email and I said, hey, you know, I, I really appreciate, thank you for the, the vote of confidence. Um, I just, I don't think I can do this. And I was kind of specific in why. Yeah, they'll respect yeah. you. Wouldn't they respect you more? Well, at the end, I put, I hope this doesn't burn my bridge, you know, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I'm fine. And interestingly, the publisher, uh, the casting director emailed me back and said, hey, no problem. Totally respect your honesty. Uh, and also said, you know, I haven't dug too far, far enough into this book. I may actually turn it away. Uh, I don't I, know what, yeah. I, I don't know what they decided. But anyway, that was the first time, and it I was, you know, I, I, I knew what I had to do, and I knew they, I was hoping they would respect me. I mean, I know them, and I figured they would, but there's a little tinge of, oh, gosh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm turning away X, you know, a couple thousand bucks for this, plus there's going to be a week in my calendar when I'm going to go, gosh, you know, I'll never work again. But also, also, can I interject something? Yeah. Johnny's been trying to say for ages to me and a friend had a problem with a book they submitted to a publisher it wasn't their doing we just had this conversation today and they were they were feeling like oh god they're not going to hire me again and that's a natural you know feeling 
But the thing is, if, if, if we feel that way and then we don't feel that we can be honest, then you're putting yourself at a different level. And none wow. of the publishers want that. They want to work with us as colleagues. They respect us more if yeah. we're honest. I mean, you, but it comes down to money, though. It's hard. It's hard when it's your Well, you have to respect mortgage. the text. You yeah. have to respect the text. I yeah. get asked to do a fair amount of books that, that on the conservative side of the political spectrum where I am not. And, um, and I, and I don't, maybe it's the authoritative nature of my voice or, or whatever. It I is, get asked. It is. It's that comfy, cozy kind of thing. And you still have to, you know, uh, I can't remember. I think, I think it might, it might've been Michael Caine in, in one of his autobiographies, or it could have been Brian Cranston in his, I listened to a lot of actors autobiographies, uh, wh whomever it was said that, that if you're playing the villain, you don't think you're a bad guy. You think you're a good guy. Yeah. And so it's the same when I'm doing, when I'm doing uh, some, you know, conservative political books, I have to, I have to believe what I'm reading because yeah. the author believed it. And if I don't believe it, the yeah, audience will know. Yeah. And that's, and that's disrespectful. And that's exactly what, after I finished, after I turned this book away, I, uh, I popped a, a message to Sean Pratt, uh, you know, who's a, a mentor and a friend and a former, and a former coach, actually an ongoing coach. I ask him every now and then for, for help. I just said, Hey, I just, I just did something that, um, you know, that kind of is a milestone for me. I turned a book down because of content. And his answer back was good for you. They need to find someone who will, who will believe in the content and, and deliver it. Right. And, and he, he was absolutely right. So Anyway, that was my big, that was the big trauma of last week. Uh, <laughs> worse, worse even than having the kitchen remodeled, which is going on right now. So, uh. But you know what I think about that, though? It goes, it's like the same thing with dry spells. And no matter how much Anna was saying this, I don't want to quote somebody quoting somebody and then I get the quote wrong and then everyone on the line gets annoyed. But um, it's about leveling up. It's, um, it's every time we think we've kind of like perfected it. Oh, been there, done that. I was talking mm -hmm. to somebody about writers because you know how you get all the notes. And, mm -hmm. I, and I had a writer with like a lot of notes, but because they're asked to give a lot of feedback, it was, it was through a, a publisher. They were asked for the feedback. They gave the feedback. But as a narrator, we know that when you see a certain type of notes, you're going, oh, okay, warning, 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 flashing, flashing, flashing. <laughs> you do know smoothly. the nature of an audio book. We can't. Yeah. And I bought into that because that's your experience as a narrator. But then I actually went back and in detail, before I even did it, the sample, had a conversation with the writer through the, I probably wasn't supposed to reach out at that point because it wasn't through ACX or anything, but everyone's fine. I was up front. I told the yeah. publisher that I was doing it. And I explained, I don't think I'm going to be the right person. I can't read this the way you want me to read it. Mm. Um, and I don't think that my style is going to allow me to do it. I'm going to try. I'll do another sample, but you have to be 100% sure because this is what you're getting. And yeah. I think we found a middle. And I think I've made a bit of a tiny bit of a colleague, a friend that respects me for being honest. I leveled up. But I was same stress. <laughs> When this happened, that I was when I was a new narrator and thought I wasn't going to get paid for something or thought a writer yeah. hated me. It, the, the reason changes, but the panic in the heart and the, oh, God. Oh, still it'll the never. Pain. I hope it never goes away. I hope I never yeah. have to turn another one down. But the same tone, I, I hope I do, because that means I've done a bunch because I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to turn very many down. But can um, you self-talk yourself down now? Or j does it feel better when you go through those leveling up moments where something else happens and you have to kind of step up to the game and deal with it? Do you, does well, it bother yeah. you as much? Well, we grow. I mean, um, we have, yeah, we have to grow. Uh, the, the Nixon book that I was talking about a little while ago, really tough, probably the heart, probably the toughest book I've ever narrated. Um, lots of parenthetical 
uh, sentences. The, the, the guy was a, uh, he was a White House aide, very top aide in the Nixon White House for the first, first four years, a very detail-oriented person. I believe he's now an investment banker or something. And he just, and so his sentences, he felt he had to explain every single thing in the sentence. And he was, he was also very formal. And so he never said Pat Moynihan. It was always Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And it was, so there's always, always the full name. And, you, you know, you don't want to stop and stumble over the name because you'll sound stupid. So a uh, very stressful book. And, uh, uh, and, and it was, it, it, it took me longer, you know, I, uh, much longer to uh, record it than I had planned. So here I am, I like to work about four hours a day in the morning and, and then prep in the afternoon. And here I am reading in the afternoon and stressing out that yeah. my voice isn't going to hold out and, um, you know, and household chores aren't getting taken care of and, and all of that. And I, and I, I made it through and um, I listened back to a little bit. I'm one of the few people that actually actually goes back and I listened to, you know, my, my own work. I listened back to some of it and I thought, wow, um, I did an okay job with this. Not going to win an Audi, you know, not going to win a prize for it, but I did a, I did a good job with this. And, uh, and what I learned from that stress, um, what I, what I took away from that experience was, Sometimes we got to work really hard to, to, to make our performance uh, viable for the audience. And sometimes we can't just, we all have some pretty natural, natural abilities. And a lot of yeah. times we can just sit down and, you know, we read the fucking book and it's, you know, and, and it people, oh my God, how did you do that? You know, it's, like, it's, it's my job. But this was the was the most difficult time I had spent in the booth and I a lot of prep and at first I hated it but when I finished it it was like okay you were proud of it I have now been stretched a little bit give me another yeah. tough one that's you know? what can I take from this lesson give take and it, I'm not and the quicker you move on I'm not a big what can I take from this lesson kind of guy I mean I don't I you know I I'm not that deep um, but, but maybe I, you do it now. I wear Hawaiian shirts all the time, you know. But you um, did it. But you did it though. I I did, and I yeah. and I, um, you know. So what I what I'm trying to say is I'm not, I'm not trying to say oh I look for a lesson and everything because I don't. I've I'm I'm old. I don't need to learn anything else. But it, <laughs> it you know life lessons. But but it was it was really cool to finish that really hard book, uh, and and one of the things I took away from it was the prep really helped. And so now I've, I'm prepping more even on the easy books than, um, than I did before I did that really hard book because I see how well it pays off. Okay, we have an audience question. I don't want to miss it because we've got a lot of people on the call. Um, Dave would like to know, how much would it affect one's success as a nonfiction narrator to draw the line more sharply? I could not do a political book that I didn't believe in, especially mm. in these times. Um, so would the first not, half, you, the do first you tell half, the publishers your question, up front, though, do you tell the publishers what kind of books you'll do when you work with them? Um, no, no. Um, I had this conversation with, uh, with the casting director who's not as yet not hired me. Uh, but we have a, we've, you know, we've got a nice relationship going on. Um, he asked me, he said, do you have trouble doing, uh, doing books from, uh, the other side of the political spectrum. And I said, no, not, you know, not at all. There, there are some lines I will draw. I don't know exactly what they are. I have finally drawn one. Uh, and so I know what it is, you know, as regarding the previous part of our conversation, but as far as violence, I doubt, I, I hope I would turn down a book that advocated violence um, especially, uh, you know, gender violence, that type of thing. I hope I would turn down a book that, um, that was blatantly was racist or denied the Holocaust or those types of things. But I've done some books uh, in answer to Dave's questions. I've done some books where I, you know, I've gotten to the end of it and gone, really? You know what? I mean, a couple of the Dershowitz books. I mean, I, you know, I, um, 
some of his conclusions I did one on, you know, why Trump shouldn't be impeached. And, and I completely disagreed with what his conclusion was, but I wasn't hired to comment on the guy's ideas. I was, I was hired because I'm, I'm a good actor and I can play the role of someone who believed that Donald Trump shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be impeached. And as people say, well, how can you do that? The, 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 um, uh, the example I give is a movie that Spike Lee produced a few years ago called um, The Bl Black Klansman. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a true story about a policeman in Colorado Springs, a black cop who, um, <laughs> by use of some interesting subterfuge, and it's, it's a documented true story, became a member of the Colorado Springs KKK. Um, because he, when on the phone, he could imitate a white guy. And then he's, and then, so then when it came time for the meetings, the, the KKK meetings, they had to send another cop. Adam Driver played the, the white cop and had to, had to go in his place. Um, and, and so when, when people say, how can you read a book? How can you narrate a book of, you know, of something that, that, you know, that you find uh, despicable? I, I ask people to watch the actors in that movie. I ask them to look at the, those, those actors on uh, Black Klansmen that had to say the most despicable, racist things. Um, and, and, and ask yourself, do you think that actor believed what they were saying? You know, now if they were good at their craft. You would believe it while you were watching it. But I don't, you know, I, I don't look at that movie um, or, or any others of historical significance like that and think any less of the, of the white players that, that uh, recite you know, dis despicable lines. Um, I, mean, I really don't think Meg Ryan has an orgasm every time she goes to, you know, Cats or wherever the hell it was. You know, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I did a book recently and it was about the Ku Klux Klan. I was a bit worried, but the main protagonist was um, a white female and everything. But the the language and the reality of it wasn't, it was, it was a lot. I, I, I felt yeah. embarrassed saying, using some of the language and everything and worried that I've offended. But then I thought I have to do the it justice. It's about, it's about somebody yeah. fighting the Ku Klux Klan. So you That's have to say- yeah, and my first so, book was a classic, and it had some terminology in it. That's oh, yeah. and Stephen Cohen said you have to do. It. I think David Dave left another message. He said, "Do you think though that drawing that line would res would restrict one's career with the publishers?" Um, oh, I okay. So, so you tell the publisher I won't do certain types of books. Okay, um, I don't. You know, well, it would would it, would it restrict or hinder you in a way yeah I mean let's let's be honest um, I want to make myself available for as as I, I want as many times as possible the casting director to think of me when a certain book comes across and the more uh, the more genres I'll do the more types of fiction I will do or types of nonfiction I will do the more chance I have of fitting into to that bill. If I start saying, well, I won't do this and I won't do that and I won't do that, I don't think they will think less of you, but they will think of you less because you're just, you're, you're not, you're not available to them for that. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've yeah. had some, some good discussions with, with a few seasoned narrators about the, the concept of a personal brand and, and which I strongly believe in. It's why the, that's why the Hawaiian shirts all the time, but <laughs> um, but you know, the argument on the other side is, well, don't put yourself in the shoebox because you won't, you, you know, you won't do as many books. And I realized that I promote myself primarily as a fiction or a nonfiction author. You've done that, fiction though. You've I done mean, a lot of fiction. But it, that restricts, because if, if I sit down with a, you know, with a, Kelly Gilday at Penguin, and I say, hey, I only do nonfiction, all of a sudden, three quarters of the books that come across her desk aren't for, you know, I'm not even going to think of Jim. Yeah. Now, if I further restricted that and said, I won't do conservative political books, 
I would say this year I would have done ha about half of the work because about half of my work is conservative political books. Do you tend, find you change? Do you find you change? Because do you know what? It turns out I have surprisingly fewer morals than I thought I did when I started. <laughs> <to carry. laughs> I, didn't, I don't know that I started with very many. Um, boy, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, do you find that your boundaries, what you thought your boundaries were, maybe just the nature of our jobs, because we read for a living and we're exposed to so many different ideas. I find that the nature of who I was has opened up in the last six years because if you think about it, your normal person reads what they want to read, what interests them. Okay. We read everything. Yeah. I, I'm more well read than I was when I started reading yeah. for a living. That's for sure. And, and I, and I read a lot. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I commend people who, can change their perspectives over time. Um, I'm kind of at the get off my lawn stage. Um, <laughs> See, I, I'm I, going the opposite direction. <laughs> I don't think I'm. I, I don't think I'm expanding my, you know, my my social or my spiritual or, uh, you know, my horizons of my opinions on things because I, I, they're they're pretty broad anyway. I mean, you know, they're they're pretty wide. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an ideator. The definition from the strengths finder thing years ago was an ideator is a person who, who loves every single idea that comes along. Uh, I just, I, 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 I will, I will love anything for a few minutes. I mean, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I do these, I do these conservative political books and I'm thinking like, I'm, you know, the guy I'm, the one I'm reading right now, I'm reading it and I, I, uh, you know, a little, a little twinge of me goes, oh shit, he's, well, that's right. You know, <laughs> and you just kind of like, geez, maybe, you know, uh, and that, that happens. But, but I think it's because I'm, I'm getting into the author's mind so much. Um, they, I, I, I've not voted in that direction yet, and I don't think there's any chance of that. Okay, I'm going to take you off just a tiny bit because I don't okay. want to miss a chance to find out about this. Radio? Tell me what you did on the radio. Tell um, me how you got into it. That was my dream when I was like a little girl. Oh, well, built beat the hell out of working. Um, uh, well, you how know, did you start? I, okay, well, gosh, uh, you you want to ask that question? How much yeah. time do we have? Yeah, um, yeah. We'll make when time. I was when I was in fifth or sixth grade in school, so 10, 11 years old, my father bought a little one of those little three inch reel to reel tape recorders for me. And I used to sit in my bedroom. There was only three minutes of tape on the damn thing, or maybe maybe 20 minutes of tape. But I used to sit in my bedroom with a single little single play phonograph record. And I would <laughs> I would drop the needle down and I would say, here's so and so and you know, here's so and so a very eclectic taste in music. And here's the William Tell Overture followed up by here's the, you know, whomever. Um, you DJ. I did. I, and I DJ. <laughs> and then when I was, I was driving a truck uh, for the, for the local telephone company delivering inter-office mail. And my roommate was a producer of a, of a syndicated radio program that generated in San Francisco for a time. And he took me to the studio and we, you know, I got to play around with all the gear and the boards and, and all of that stuff. And uh, a few years later, I was a, a night security guard listening to a radio station in Los Angeles that was advertising. If you've ever wanted to be a DJ, you know, come to our school. And for those of you who remember the Columbia School of Broadcasting, you know, years and years ago, um, I see some people laughing. Okay, and you're aging yourself there. Um, uh, these people charged a couple of thousand dollars and taught us all to be DJs. And lo and behold, I got a job being a DJ in a town. In I, I, live, I was living in Long Beach at the time. I got a job at a town in Wyoming where the radio station went off at night and came back on in the morning. And there were physically more cows in the county than there were human beings. Were um, you thinking this was your dream? Or were you oh, God, like, yes. 
I was wow. going to be a disc jockey for the rest of my life. For um, music, not talk show, music. No, not talk show. Well, and, and uh, it, a couple of challenges there. It doesn't pay much, um, you know, unless you're a big star. And to take on extra responsibilities at the station to earn more money, I volunteered to read the news. And the, the funny thing about reading the news is that you get to talk longer than about you know, the six or seven seconds on the intro to the music, you, they give you a whole damn 15 minutes. And, you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I fell in love with it. So you I couldn't was, go off script when it was music? You weren't allowed to, like, take up extra time? No, no. It, you know, it was the very formatted, you know, every, every radio station had to sound the same. I, we, and I we've got a female. It. Sarah Nessel was also in radio. She huh. was a daytime only AM okay. station. Yeah. Person. yeah. But, Melissa but, Moran there. You know, I've run into quite a few people, you know, narrate. Do you hear but, women had a hard time? She says it wasn't great for women. Oh, back gosh. In the day. No, it's a very it's a I mean, I'm and I'm guilty of this. Um embarrassed to say but it's a very male dominated industry <clears throat> the radio business and it's it can get pretty raunchy i mean you know it can get pretty raunchy even on the air these days but off the air you know it was a pretty patronistic misogynistic you know situation and i and if, and, if, and if melissa had worked at my station i can imagine that she'd probably say the same things about me because we were all like that that's not an excuse wow. you know i mean and we, we were all like that and we were stupid and, and, and we shouldn't have been doing it, talking like that. But, um, you know, just the teasing and all that, you know, shit, yeah. Um, yeah. harmless. Um, but, yeah, the news, um, I, I had I got better pay, you know, so, and I just kind of gravitated toward that. And with radio, you're moving from market to market to market. And every time I'd move, it, you know, do you want a DJ? Uh, you know, how about a new, oh, a news guy. And, you know, and with this voice, you know, it's very authoritative <laughs> sounding. Boom, I got these jobs in the news. So, so is that, that your natural voice or did you kind of learn to be authoritative? Are <laughs> <laughs> you, you always an asshole? Yeah, you know, um, no, but you do have, you do have a gravitas. And the reason I specifically am asking, yeah. Jim, is because I want to do those hard-hitting, ha hardcore thrillers. And I don't want to do it just the way the women do it. I want to do it the way the men do it, as her voice cracks. But the Jeff Hardings, the Jim Seberts, oh, I'm sorry, you've got that, like, take Carol me Monda. seriously. I mean, yeah, look at Carol Monda. Carol's got that. Carol has that. She's got it. But uh, no, but there's like a... Rosenblatt? Uh, uh, sorry, Barbara just called Barbara Rosenblatt. It Barbara Rosenblatt. Yeah. But they're oh, all... They're all... Hitler. Hillary? They're entrancing, enchanting, and amazing. But there is something in About your that. voice, in a Jeff wow. Harding voice, that is a "Don't mess with me, I'll kill you" kind of thing. And I don't, Jason Culp is another one. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know about those guys. Um, I, it, it is, it, it's natural. Is it? You've always yeah. had it. Um. Yeah, I mean, I tease people that and this is the truth, honest to goodness truth. The radio school I told you about earlier had a teacher named Art Hannes who worked with uh, Edward R. Murrow uh, in CBS News back in the you know, Battle of the Blitz and, and all that. And uh, he was Ed Sullivan's offstage announcer on, on his radio program, on his TV program, um, when it was the talk of the town and then the Ed Sullivan show. Art Hannes was the voice of CBS. He was my voice coach, 1974. Honest to God truth. His advice to about 20 of us who wanted to be radio broadcasters was, gentlemen, of course it was only gentlemen, gentlemen, I suggest you smoke cool filterless cigarettes, the little cool shorts, and gargle with whiskey before you go on the air. The reason for that was the, the, the cigarette smoke, the menthol, um, got rid of the phlegm in your throat, <laughs> you know, while you were reading the news, you wanted a really dry mouth. We weren't terribly interested with mouth noise uh, when we were on the air. Cat knows me well. I'm sitting here going, ooh, what if I took menthol cough drops and gargled with whiskey? 
I, <laughs> I don't want to I, smoke. <laughs> yeah. I, see, I, I mean, I don't know. I joke with people that, that that's a true story that that actually happened. But I do think my voice has. I early on when I was doing radio, when I was doing commercials um, at the local radio station, people would say, I, I want that guy with, you know, with that voice. And I, you know, and so one bank actually asked me to come in and record it like early in the morning and don't talk before you, before you do our ads. Cause they wanted this really uh, kind of raspy voice like that, you know, that, that, that morning voice. I, I early on, I, um, I realized that that was a, you know, that was a pretty useful tool. People like the sound of this. And I, and I did, you know, I have worked on, on kind of increasing the resonance in our, but it is, I mean, it is pretty much how I talk. I'm very uh, protective of this instrument, just like Sammy Hagar would be of his, you know, Fender guitar or whatever. Um, what do you mean just protective? Like, um, I, uh, I, I no longer smoke, uh, uh, cigarettes. Uh, that's been years. Um, even though I love tobacco, I have reduced cigar smoking to maybe, oh, Byron Wagner's going to kill me for this, but maybe once every six weeks or two months, something like that. It used to be every time I'd finish a book. He's going to kill you because it's too much or too little. Pardon me? He'll kill you because it's too much or too little. Yeah, I, I'm leaving the club. Um, <laughs> But he, but no, I used to, I used to have a cigar every time I finished a book, but then, you know, you you sit there and you realize that would be like, uh, you know, Liberace pounding his fingers with a hammer. Um, this is where I make my money. So I, I should be careful of it. I, um, I just realized, talk about sexism and, and living our, our roles. You celebrated finishing a book by having a cigar. I celebrate by cleaning the flat. That is so sad. <laughs> I know, I know women uh, narrators who would gladly join me in having a cigar to finish the book. So, and I frankly know a couple of guys who probably would rather enjoy cleaning, but you know, so to, to each his own. Yeah, I'm a cliche in the own. worst way. So yeah. how did you start narrating, Jim? I had a, uh, well... Very first narration was 10, 11 years ago in 2010. In fact, it was right now in 2010. I had written a book on leadership that was published by Tyndale House, and Tyndale House sold the audio rights to Oasis. You're a published writer as well. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so Oasis wanted the you know, Oasis wanted the author to read the book. So they hired a studio here in town, and I went in and and read the book and they, they, they paid me 50 bucks an hour, which I thought was just wonderful. Um, uh, um, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, but I never did think at that time, gosh, I had to do this for other people. I thought I had to write another book and then, you know, to narrate it. it. I didn't read, I didn't know. Uh, you know, there's this huge industry out there, you know, uh, doing these books. So I uh, didn't give it a second thought. I uh, had a job. I was uh, uh, doing some corporate training. And so I was driving from city to city to city to city. I teach all day and then I drive to the next town, the next town, the next town. Middle of like, America. How did you like that? It was horrible. <laughs> um, paid the bills. Uh, you know, looking back, the only thing that was good about it was I got to perform every day. You know, uh, I got to pretend I was a project seasoned project manager. <laughs> um, <laughs> just follow the script, baby. Uh, so anyways, <laughs> I'm, I'm driving across these, you know, God forsaken, you know, states with, you know, nothing between towns. And the only thing on the radio is religion, Spanish music or country music, you know, and I don't like any of those. So um, I started listening to audiobooks, and uh, I was getting tired of driving from city to city, and you know, being in a different hotel every night and eating all by myself. And I was listening to these audiobooks. I was listening to uh, R.C. Bray do the do uh, the Martian, and somewhere in that book, I went, "Shit, you used to sit in front of a microphone and driving the car." Yeah. You can do this. It's it can't, how hard can it be? <laughs> Nothing is have... motivating as having a job you hate. <laughs> so I, because of some previous employment, I knew a bunch of publishers already. 
Um, and so I, um, I fired off 30 something emails to all these people. And I said, Hey, you know, thinking of doing audio books, you know, what are your thoughts? Oh, you'd be great. Great voice, blah, 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 blah. None of them gave me any advice I could do anything with, except one guy introduced me to Corey Werner. Corey Werner was doing, uh, uh, Christian audio at the time. Um, he turned me on to his casting director. Um, they had a they had a handful of B-level books that they really didn't want to pay full boat to have somebody narrate them. So they, they paid me a decent rate, a decent rate. Uh, but I couldn't believe I was going to get paid that much. It's about three times more than I thought I was going to be able to get paid. Oh, uh, recorded the had had audacity on my Mac, recorded into that with this cheap ass little microphone and um I won't mention the brand because some people might actually use it. Um, Were you and, hooked? Were you kind of hooked at that point? Um, I was hooked that I could make money just reading books. Jesus. Yeah. How incredible is that? And uh, so then, you know, it, it went on from there and I did five books for them. So my very first books were PFH and um, that was awesome. I didn't have to go through all the pain of doing a whole bunch of books, you know, without getting paid for it. That was yeah. very fortunate. And, and I know that, um, uh, and then, you know, and that, that went off to others and, you know, one, one guy said, oh yeah, I heard that and this and that. So anyway, that's how I got started five years ago. So did you at any point think I should quit? What, what was the journey like for you? Did you have any dark souls of the night once you started yeah. doing it? Yeah. Um, you know, those first five, and then I, I had a couple others and, and I, I did a few on ACX. I did four on ACX because I, uh, um, I wanted to know how to do it. I wanted to know how to do ACX in case an author or somebody wanted me to, you know, the whole uploading and, and all of that. Um, that was a learning experience. Um, and then there was about, I don't know, six, eight months somewhere in there after i'd done it maybe i can't remember maybe a year and a half and i yeah. i got a little bit of money and i bought a decent mic and you know and all of that and um and i do remember being like wow i'm you know there's there's nothing here because i really don't like doing rs books i really there's just something about and i know some people have made and are making fabulous money doing royalty share books um i just i Unless I'm being paid for it, I, I can't get into it quite as much. Can't, uh, don't know why. But I, uh, so I, uh, during that period, it was six, eight, maybe nine months, I did some books on spoken realms so that I could just keep, um, I could, you know, keep working my craft and didn't go crazy. Um, and that, then it, that, you know, how did that feel doing some spoken realm books? I find you know, it that was, that was different. That wasn't yeah. a, I considered that a little different. Again, I'm not a person that really deeply thinks through this shit, but I, <laughs> the difference between the RS book and the stuff I did, and I just finished another one for Spoken Realms, is that that's a book I picked out. I found yep. it. I was really passionate about it. It's your baby. Was, it's mine. It's yeah. not somebody else's that maybe they're going to promote it or not. This is, I really want to do this book. The cover is cool because yeah, you well, chose I just, it. I just did one that um, that I found on Gutenberg called the Autobiography of Methuselah, um, and I it was it's been approved for retail at Spoken Realms. Now I don't know how long it takes two three weeks or a month or whatever, but it was the autobiography of a man purported to be nine hundred and sixty nine years old when he died, and it, so it was a it was a funny book, very dry, written in. The, in the 19 early 1900s um very dry humor but he's talking about how adam didn't adam didn't like clothing and you know and and <laughs> cain was the only person the only dark horse in our whole family you know and, and that type. and his son was noah and he says i really worried about my son noah with this you know this boat he's building 25 miles from the ocean so it was a it was a fun book and i don't care if i ever make a dime on it i mean i i hired yeah. somebody to design the cover i hired an editor a, a proofer an editor to you know to do all the post for me i will and, and the damn thing's only maybe three and a half hours long four hours long something like that so i mean it's it's not going to sell that much 
uh, when it, you know, when it does get up, I'll make, you know, uh, I don't know what I'll make 50 bucks every quarter or something off of it. Um, but I just, it, 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 like you say, it was my baby and I love yeah. doing it. Yeah. I think, and I also think, I think it's like clearing the palate. I think yeah, doing something like that without any of the other stuff, the publishers, the writers, because, because we, who are we to say there are other layers of expectations on every book we do there that aren't to do with just the text. I, that's our job to get to just the text, but in there's always what the publisher thinks of me, what the writer thinks of me, what, oh, yeah. you know, how it's going to be reviewed, how I'm going to get money. There is all that, whether, no yeah. matter how good we are at managing it, but when it's your own book, you're yeah. brought right to that tech and that's it. So it's like cleaning your palate. It's yeah. good I, exercise. I, I think it really helped me. I love doing it. it uh, I, there was no timing. It took me almost a year to do it. Cause I, you know, I'd start it. <laughs> this guy's 969 freaking years old. How he can wait. <laughs> how? Well, yeah, he can wait. How do, and the, and the book was, it was carved into stone. So it was, I mean, you know, I carry this, you know, this piece of stone in the booth every day. No page turn noises. Um, but no, it's like, you know, what voice do I give this guy? You know, he's, he's 969 years old. I can't do it a whole book, you know, because it's fiction. So I'm trying to stretch myself yeah, a little bit. Yeah. That wouldn't be sustainable for me or, you know, or the listener. So it's just, that was one. I, um, I used a director, a, a, what I call a pre-director. On, uh, I wanted to ask you how often you do that. How, how does I, that work for you? I want to do it on every single book. The one I'm doing right now, I couldn't because they, you know, they basically, they called me and said, look, this is a rush to print. We need to get this done. It's very timely. Um, so, you know, can, can you do this? I didn't have time to, to send it out and have somebody look at it, but I want to do it on, on every book. Um, and because it just, it gives me it gives me another perspective before sitting down and reading and reading the book. Um, so what I, what I do is I'll, I send off uh, sometimes the whole manuscript or sometimes just two or three chapters uh, have the, the individual Kimberly Weatherall has been one that's been helping me with mm. this. She'll, she would read a little bit of the script and then we would just get on the phone with no real agenda. And then I would give her my thoughts. This is how I think I would, you know, I would do this. This is the audience I think uh, I would have for this. And then she'll say, okay, yeah, what do you think of this? And, and, uh, and so what it has led me to do um, is to bring little props into the room um, with oh. me. Um, I did this book on, um, uh, oh, the Methuselah book uh, was one. He, he, his character in the book, he's kind of a silly guy. You know, I'm, I mean, anybody that would that would live to be 969 years old and carve his, uh, you know, his uh, memoir into stone blocks would have to be a, a little bit goofy. And I'm um, assuming it's a fiction. It, you know, it, <laughs> no, it's the real. No, it's fiction. <laughs> and uh, and so what you know, what I came up with was I, I couldn't like wear a toga into the booth every day or something. So I had this. Uh, I don't know if I still have it. I got this real goofy little bow tie and I uh -huh. slipped it on every morning before I started reading because it, it just, it reminded me that this character is a goofy little guy. Um, I, I do it on nonfiction. Um, I've, I've had a cigar in the booth when I did the, the, the book on uh, uh, the outlaws of the wild west. Um, cause I'm oh, talking to that. Kim, talking to Kimberly about it. And she goes, well, she goes, do you have a cheroot at the in the house? I said, yeah, I got some cigars. So I went <laughs> up and I got a cigar and I, you know, I actually, now I couldn't, where is it? Here it is. I couldn't, um, put it in my mouth when I narrated, you know, kind of, I kind of talk where yeah. I, I can't talk about it. but I would, you know, I would hold it. I would smell it between chapters. And it just, it did, it helped me become this guy as a Brit, he was a Brit who had written about these American outlaws. This interesting book talking about Billy the Kid and using the word wild, wildst, 
whilst well whilst Billy whilst. the Kid was you know and, and because <laughs> he wrote with kind of a more a very refined British um, kind of language anyway. So do you? So how do you feel about accents? You know, it's I I do an improv class um, every Monday, and um, and one of the things that they that the class you know we get together at the end is big huggy kissy kumbaya stuff and you know, <laughs> kudos to each other, and almost every week um, <laughs> someone will say something about either my physicality or the the character stuff I do. Um, when we're doing scenes and uh, and I, you know I, I I I love doing that I love being a character um, when I'm just kind of goofing around like I said early on I live in a fantasy zone but I have a real difficult time in the studio doing doing voices I just I I don't know that I've learned to get out of my head quite as as much as i as i should I, I i still think i'm just somebody doing goofy voices and um and i don't think i would do the i don't think i will do really good dialogue fiction until i get to the point where i can just relax and just be the silly guy without really you know without thinking about it but if there's a script in front of me and someone expects me to say it a certain way it 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 inhibits me. I would love to get, I would love to get beyond that. Yeah. So it's like playing the character, not the caricature. Yeah. It, it, yeah. 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 Um, like I'm that way beyond. physically. I'm that way physically with, I, I recently joined TikTok and they're all making faces and, and like they'll put music on, they'll make faces to the music. I would be horrified. I'm not funny. I would sit there with a frozen face going, oh my God, because I'm not, I'm too self-conscious. Yeah. Like about m mugging and I can't, I just. Yeah. Deer in the headlight. Yeah. But I have no embarrassment at all about making odd noises and voices in the booth. You, the other day on one of the Facebook, on one of the Facebook chats or forums, someone was saying that there was a, there was a book where the, the, uh, one of the characters had really bad gas. And when they, when they would pass it, it and, and it was written like PFFFFFT. I, I like, saw that. They were like, how do I do I, that? What should I do? I, I loved all the different descriptions of what you should do. You know, somebody said, you should say PFFFFFT. No. You know, you should go. And then somebody said, well, you know, if you do make the raspberry sound, you know, you know you've got to vary it throughout the page because, you know, I mean, think about it. No fart. It's like a no fart. Sounds the same as the last part. Shorter, you know. Part. <laughs> little pieces will come out. You know, who knows? <laughs> That'd be an editor's dream, wouldn't it? Uh, uh. I'd like to see what Positron did with that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! So, so okay. So, and here's a good one. And you would actually, full disclosure, Jim had said, well. There, I, there are interesting things that, that we can talk about. And I said, yeah, you'll be lucky. Meantime, racking my brain, what can I find out about him? Oh, How boy. did his parents really yeah. meet? But I, I am actually very interested in why, what you said about protecting your personal time. Um, if, it, if it came from not having done it, or if you've always done it, or I'm not good at it. So I would like to learn from someone that is because I don't at all. <laughs> um, I have the, for, I, I'm fortunate in that I don't have to pay my mortgage with my craft. Um, I'm at a point where um, my, my wife still works. Um, I, mean, I work, but she actually has a, a job and uh, supplies a good part, most of the income for our family. So the money that I make, I can put into savings, plow back into, you know, goodies, uh, webinars, those types of things. So it really Vacation. is the love of the art for you. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have, what I'm saying is I don't have to work as hard as a lot of people. Okay. Um, you know, I've got a friend last year. I got a friend last year did 85 books. She is a mom with a couple of kids uh, wow. and she did 85 books. 
um, uh, many, many friends and many people watching or listening, you know, in the 50 books a year range. Um, I don't want to work that hard. And when I do work that hard, and I don't mean just in the studio, there's a, there's a lot of self-marketing and shit that goes on with, you know, doing that many books, 85 books, 50 books. Um, and so I, number one, I don't want to work that hard. Number two, I wouldn't be as good. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just not good when I'm rushed. Um, I, I really, you know, I take my time. And, uh, and I like to build in days between each project. So I finish a project, I get clean that author out and, and do a lot of the household chores and you know, play with the dog and, and all of that. So you know yourself. Uh, Have you always known yourself or did you get it wrong in the beginning? I'm, I mean, I'm pretty narcissistic. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I've known myself, but uh, what I have what I've learned about myself is that number one, I'm better in the morning at just about everything. Um, you know, I, I, I need a nap in the afternoon. I, you know, I, I know that about myself and my, and if I push myself too far, the performance suffers. And I would rather do 25 books as best I can than do 50 books, you know, not so good. Now, please don't hear what I'm not, I'm not saying this you're doing 50 books a year and it's working for you and, and, and you keep getting the work. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. No, I, know if I, 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 I think I would, I would have put a disclaimer too, but honestly, it did not sound like you were saying that. Yeah. At well, all. I just, I mean, I, I really respect people who can do that many books. Um, I also respect people who have full-time jobs and families and can do one book every other month or something and do a good job at it it's um, hard because i used to be a person i was always it's so and i'm still am for myself but i was very type a and very judge myself on my productivity and um i don't I even mean, go there with anyone else anymore because the minute yeah. you've stared down the barrel of that impossible deadline there is no judgment anywhere you do one book every 10 years you are still a narrator and i get it yeah, <laughs> yeah as long as you're doing the best job you know the best yeah. job you can you I, i've that never book well I, I spent eight years in corporate america vice president yeah. of marketing for a, a bookseller um and fun times. uh pardon me fun times yeah fun times i mean um <laughs> And I would, you know, I'd go on trips with these guys, again, guys, you know, lots of, lots of men in the upper suites of American business getting better. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of these people I worked with were, I mean, they would work 12, 14 hours a day and they're all, you know, and they're in the airport, they're on the phone to their assistant and their staff and everything. And I, I'm getting paid the same they are, and I'm not doing any of that stuff. I just, you know, I I have never, not that I don't like to work hard. Um, I've just never been, you know, driven to work and work and work and work and work. And 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 Jim is a much happier person when he has time to breathe. I mean, and also how much do they, I mean, I can't judge because I detested it. I worked the corporate job nine years management position and I don't think as a woman I felt like they still expected me to run off and get the tea for them but okay. um, but I had the job it was my fault that I didn't have the guts to kind of move on I did acting on the side but there was a guy there he was like a boss and he was there and he retired and tons of money I mean it was a big company so he retired and he, but he was always there 24 hours a day he had a heart attack, I think, four days after he retired and died. So I, I hope he loved it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the guy worked constantly. I, so if you're going to, if some people love business, I'm not that person, but some people, and that's how I feel about like, you know, they say take days off. I try to take days off. I've not been able to master it yet, but at least I love my workahol, what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, I, mean, love you, it. I mean, you, you have to, I was uh, in anticipation of this call. I was thinking about that, you know, do, do you love your work thing? And I, do you, I, you know, I can't say that I do. Um, 
I can't say that I, you know, giddy skip down the stairs every morning. Oh, goody, I get to, you know, narrate books. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I'm there. What I, what I can say is that um, I am happiest in the hours that I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, but the rest of I, the business requirements have all sorts of feelings. Yeah. I mean, I close the door. I put on the headphones. I, whatever silly prop I'm going to hold in my hand or, you know, what I've worn a yarmulke, you know, all sorts of different things. <laughs> Um, and I am happiest then looking back over my life, the happiest times are when I have been performing you know, oh, I love that. or something, you know, something like that. And, um, and so I, I enjoy the fortune of being able to do what gives me so much pleasure to go so far as to say, Oh, I love it. I, I'm not deriding people who, who say that. But you did just say, I don't understand the difference. Is it just maybe the way you express it? Because, okay, to be honest, Jim, it might be just a form of expression because I love my morning coffee. Like with yeah. a passion, I would sell my soul for it. It's the best thing in the whole world. You see what I'm saying? I'm a person yeah. that either yeah. loves or hates something. Maybe you just... I. I don't, I don't gush over. I mean, I love being a narrator. I love one of the coolest things is, um, is when someone asks you, what do you do? <laughs> you know, and you tell them I narrate audiobooks, and they, you mean for audible or something? And they get that look on their face. They've never met one of us. And then they have <laughs> 10,000 questions. And then it gets to, you know, my aunt always says I had a good voice and maybe, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, you know, I I love all of that. I love Tuesdays, you know, release day. I love all of that. Um, I love the community. I mean, I, I became an ambassador for APA so I could, you know, stand and shake people's hands. I'm forced to stand and shake people's hands and they have to shake my hand and or fist bump or whatever. And, and so uh, what, what does make you giddy? What do you love? What would you say you'd skip down the stairs with excitement about? I don't want to be glib. Um, oh, be glib. You're talking to a bunch of Americans. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, love, I, mean, I, love I love baseball. So, you know, what I do on the side, I'm a PA announcer for a college summer league. And oh, wow. uh, I, you know, I skip off to that. I, I love doing that. Um, I did some stand-up comedy for a while. I would, I would probably skip off to that. The thing I miss about, about doing books is that even though I know there's an audience there, the, the response isn't, you know, there's not the immediate response you get when you're performing live. Do you ever um, perform on Discord? Would you ever do that? You know, a bunch of people have suggested, you know, Wagner and, and Kyle Tate and a bunch of others, you know, do that. I, I Frankly, I'm not that stupid when it comes to, you know, apps and stuff and computer stuff, yeah. but I... I went on that there Discord and I didn't understand. And I I couldn't figure out what the hell to do with it. So I, you know, it, I it, uh, it's not it's not instinctual. It, it's it does yeah. make me feel a bit stupid too. Um, yeah. I, I tried to do Discord and Clubhouse at the same time one day. That was a treat. Well, and you're I doing this on the writer. The, yeah, you're doing this on the Clubhouse, and that's that's yeah. amazing. And but the thing is, I'm not someone that wants an audience. I, I'm quite happy not having a live audience. Well, I'm I'm a hermit for sure, and I, I that's another thing I love about the job is I don't you know it's uh, there's not a whole bunch of other people around while I'm doing it. Um, but I um, I explode when I when I can be in front of people. That's why I'm doing the improv class because i get not to do stand up anymore why no. do you never get um, tempted you know i just i kind of outgrew that yeah. um and frankly the the stand up the, the two times i did stand up was when my life was in the shitter um and you know no money you know crappy job 
you know, living in a horrible place. Oh, there's, you want, you want somebody to do stand up at your bar? Sure. I'll, you know, is, is that kind of, when life is going well, it's very difficult to be a comic for me. I mean, you know, it just, it seems like comedy works better when you're in pain. Like who's that woman that writes the songs whenever she like breaks up with someone? I'm, can you see how no, Adele is that, was no, it Adele? No, no, it's not a no. Adele. Um, Taylor Swift. Yeah. Oh. Whenever she breaks up with someone, she writes good songs, you yeah. know, good arts. And, and Bukowski was half of what he wrote was right. informed by his like life. So sure. I love, but I still, I still, I mean, giddy with it or not, or the way you name it, you can hear something in your, in your samples, in your, you, you just, you open your, there's just something beguiling. And, and now I see you don't do it on purpose, <laughs> which is kind of disappointing because well, I was thinking you'd give me the hack. <laughs> I, uh, well, you just yeah, I mean, I mean, I like being the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. Um, I, I, I created years and years and years ago when I was, you know, doing marketing and corporate marketing and all this, and we were, we were talking about marketing. I came up with this phrase, you know, that if you're doing something, you can, and you want to change it, you can either do a thing differently or do a different thing. And I called it thing one and thing two. I'm a big one for variety. I will brush my teeth with the other hand every now and then just because I get bored. I will drive a different route. That's good just for to, you. Just to drive the different route. I will, you know, I'm, Parts of me are pretty habitual. I order the same thing at the Mexican restaurant every time. But, um, but that's and so good when for I'm, your brain. That what when you I'm just reading, did. when I'm yeah. narrating, I I'm the thing that I'm that I'm conscious of is making sure that the and it 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 comes almost organically is altering the pace and making sure that I don't get into and this sounds very basic, but I, I don't think enough people intentionally do this. Um, you know, no, you pay know attention. What? That's why they say that people that retire sometimes, because they're not for, sometimes you have to be forced out of those comfort zones to carve new neural pathways. And sometimes yeah. people that retire, suddenly they're lost because they're just up to their own devices. So they're going to do right. what's comfortable. And then they, they stop growing. Into, and also that's not good for your brain. That's what causes people to get old. It's not that they're suddenly old. That it's that they, they, well, they stop, they stop and also, I read an article today about the pandemic and about why so many people are coming out of the pandemic feeling befuddled, like confused, they're forgetting things, they're having a heart, they thought they'd jump right back in and everything would be fine, but they're not feeling as fast as they were. And it's because stress is a big load on the brain, but also because of what you just said, and I can feel it myself, I don't force myself to do anything differently. And now when I do, like even just leave the house for something, I am exhausted. So you're, what you're doing is good, good for you. It, you know what I mean? It's good. Do you yeah. physically, do you physically exercise or anything as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, part of the morning pages um, from, uh, from the artist way, um, this is an unusual thing for me to sit down not the very first thing in the morning. So I got to have my PG tips. I got to check my email, all <laughs> that. But I, you know, one of the first things I'll do is I'll sit down and I'll, I'll do the morning pages. She wants you to write three. I usually write two because I don't like rules. Um, <laughs> don't you fucking tell me to write three pages. I'm going to write two. God damn it. Have this. And, um, and then I have, I have um, fairly regularly but not frequently gone from the writing down to the treadmill. It's right there. Um, and, uh, and put in some time and then go into narrate. Um, I actually, I find that, that um, I'm more mentally, you know, the mental acuity is a little bit up after I've done the walking, but it hasn't become a habit yet. 
and I'd like it to become a habit. I can think of all sorts of excuses why it can't be. Yeah, you know, oh, I, I, I bought walk. a treadmill, Jim. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to buy one like new, <laughs> only five minutes. <laughs> it's, it's under my bed. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, Jim, I can't forget this very important part of the Joe call. Um, it's a, it's kind of a hazing, if you will. Cool. Um, for the people that will be watching this YouTube video for the next 90 years, can you please leave us with some final words of wisdom, brilliance, um, something you want us to remember, words of warning? What would you like to leave us with? Something that encapsulates Jim Siebert. Oh, my. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to be glib while I'm trying to think of something deep and philosophical. And you know me, I'm a fan of glib. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Sidney Freeman on MASH, uh, his advice to uh, all of the uh, nurses and doctors at the 407 was, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, take my advice pull down your pants and slide on the ice. <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that I, so a word of wisdom, <clears throat> listen to artist and actor um, autobiographies. Mm. <clears throat> I have learned so much. I have grown mentally so much by spiritually by listening to Jenna Fisher's book. Um, uh, Jenna Fisher was Pam on, uh, on The Office. Her book, I think, was called An Actor's Life. Brian Cranston's book, uh, Life on Stages. Um, Anything that um, uh, Brian Cranston, uh, of Steve Martin's book, um, Marty Short's book. Um, I'm trying to think of the great Michael, Sir Michael Caine, uh, especially his latest Blow the Bloody Doors Off. Uh, John Cryer's book, So Then This Happened. Um, Colin, uh, Colin Yost, the guy from Saturday Night Live, just listened to his. He got an Audi uh, for doing it. I've learned a lot about the craft listening to these guys and men and women and the struggles that they've had. Chapter four in Jenna's book is all about how do you handle the family that says, uh, okay, that's nice. When are you getting a real job? Or could you have done better? What, what would you have done different in that audition to get, you know, to get, maybe you should do your hair different or something, you know, and, <laughs> and how to answer those questions. That's in, that's in Jenna's book. Um, John Cryer, great advice on, on going to the audition, doing the best job you can, then walking out and saying, fuck it, I'm going to dinner, you know, and just, um, uh, you know, Brian Cranston, what a, his was a phenomenal book as well. Um, listen to those. Uh, you will learn a lot about the craft um, with those books. So there's my off the wall advice. That's a good reminder because it is the things we put into our brain. It's like junk. I've been giving my brain junk food this last year. I mean, I listen to a lot of audiobooks at night, which are great. And I listen to podcasts, but I could listen to less podcasts and a couple more biographies. I could listen to a little bit more music. I could listen to things that push me and enrich me a little bit yeah. more than how to fast on a podcast. Well, yeah. Stop and the eating. The thing for me is like, how did, how did Steve Martin handle years and years of rejection? You know, how did, how did, how did John Cryer, you know, what is, you know, how does he, that's, that's what's cool about listening to those. Michael Keynes was, what was interesting to me on that one is he's gotten, Michael's gotten to a point or like, I know it, Michael, Michael, I, uh, um, I served Kane him gotten, coffee. You know, I served him coffee every really? morning for like a year and like, I didn't know who he was. I mean, He's, he's gotten to a point in his career where he doesn't have to work all the time. 
And while I don't have the same, you know, you know, celebratory success that he has, I've gotten to that point in my life too. And it was, it was great to hear him kind of talk about how he chose roles and how he, how he kind of transitioned into being, you know, from being Oscar nominated, you know, actor to being, you know, the, the guy that just plays the, the, you know, the silly old man or the shopkeeper or some, you know, something like that. And, how he, you know, he turned the one role, the minor, minor role, supporting role of, of Alfred uh, in Batman into, I think, uh, some kind of nomination, a nominated award. So it was just, it was interesting to hear, you know, a guy late in his career talk, talk about things too. So I'm, anyway, getting, that's, I'm getting back into that. I, I haven't done it in a long time. Yeah. That's very good. That's very, very good final words. Those are very good final words. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So you're going to have me bugging you in about a year when the schedule clears up again, because I haven't covered even a third <laughs> of all the questions. And I can't oh. even blame the weirdo hackers because we got rid of them in quick time. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for joining us, Jim. I've had so much pleasure and learned so much from you. Um, this, this was fun. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Did you love it? Like yeah, I did. And running no, down the stairs, love it. No changes, <laughs> no edits. Don't take anything out. Leave it all in. Yes, yes. I will stitch the two together and no one will even know we got yeah. hacked. Yeah. All no, right. it was it was honestly a pleasure. And I'd love to have you back sometime. You guys, thank you so much. And thanks for logging back in. And thank you, Clubhouse people. I love you. And thank you, Jim. You are a star. Right. I want to be reading your autobiography someday. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Come on, everybody, tap along. First, you scrub a dub, then you tap and rub. You might have to yell when you hear the bell ring out loud and long. Oh, everybody, scrub along and play.